What's going on guys? I got a lot of requests lately to do a DIY episode on the retractable home climbing wall. This is it. Welcome. I sectioned the video into two main parts. Part number one will be the planning of the wall. Proper planning is crucial because you're handling quite a bit of investment here and also quite a bit of you know heavy huge single parts which you don't want to run into troubles with during the building phase which is gonna be Part two of the video, the actual building of the wall with all the challenges, unexpected and expected that we ran into because of course we didn't, or, or me, I didn't plan everything through 100%. So there were quite some surprising troubles that we had to deal with. Um, yeah, and I want to share that as well, you know. Before we start, a uh, little disclaimer here, I'm not a structural engineer. I visited a higher technical school, so I know how to, be, uh, to calculate basic stuff, but that's pretty much it. This is not a construction manual or anything. This is rather a video sharing ideas, sharing lessons learned when it comes to DIY home building walls. Although I think the wall is now pretty safe and solid in its final state, we did definitely go through phases, especially during the build where this was rather less the case, I think. So yeah, I'm sure some of the things I did could have been done better. If you've got some experience to share, please do so down below and maybe help a fellow builder out there somewhere out. That would be very appreciated. Also, if you've got something from the vid, always drop a like. That's also very appreciated and helpful for the algorithms and stuff like that. You know the deal. And with all that out of the way, I would say, let's get started, let's go. There are three important questions you have to ask yourself when it comes to planning. First, do I have space for the wall? Do I have enough space to actually use it? Second, given the space I have, what part dimensions and materials do I need to build it? And third, given the materials I need, can I create a solid enough structure to handle the mounting weight? Let's start with the space question by looking at our room as an example. To make things more descriptive, I used a downscaled 1 to 20 side view sketch. You can see the kitchen on the right end, the ceiling with the beams on top hovering at a a height of 237 centimeters above the floor. The room is about 5 meters long but only 3 meters wide. Hence it was clear from the beginning that the wall would, if at all, only fit in lengthwise, especially when taking the need for falling space into account. Going from here, the beam arrangement and characteristics would allow for two mounting options of a completely retractable 45 degree overhanging wall, either mounted on beam number two facing away from the kitchen or mounted on beam number four facing towards the kitchen. Facing away from the kitchen was more practical for three reasons. There is more falling space, using the kitchen without restrictions is possible even when the wall is set up and the room storing the mattresses used as crash pads is much closer and setting everything up for training would be much easier. Now that the space Spacing is clear. What about part dimensions and materials? In my opinion, the ideal climbing wall for training purposes is 45 degrees overhanging and starts with what I call a kicker of around 30 centimeters at the bottom. A small piece of wall perpendicular to the floor for using feet on very low starts, which also adds to the steepness as we will see later. The less overhanging a wall, the less need for a kicker, in my opinion. Given these parameters, I calculated how long the actual wall piece needs to be and I ended up with 293.7 centimeters. The total board length needed would thus be 293.7 plus 30 centimeters is 323.7 centimeters while I was still unsure about the width. I figured it should be something from 150 centimeters to 160 so that I can barely span it. My wingspan is 174 so this would probably give me enough options to create problems on the finished wall later on. And there would still be enough space to sidestep the wall and get from one to the other end of the room without too much hassle. In the end I decided to get inspired by what the hardware store offered. A word about sizing in general. I'm not a big dude, 174 centimeters span at 173 centimeters height, so for me a small wall like this this is still an awesome playground. If you're a big dude like 2 meters wingspan at 190 centimeters or something, taking into account that starting very low will be very hard for you, you would have very little climbing room until you reach the top, maybe one or two moves. I on average string 3 hard moves together until I'm at the top, which is just great for max strength training, the main purpose of my wall. Anyway, with all that info under my belt, I went to the hardware store. It turned out they offer a standard board size of 3 meters times 1.5 meters, 3 mm millimeter thickness increments and a cutting service, but any additional material exceeding the standard size would mean I'd have to pay for two whole boards, you know the deal. Regarding board material, I went with an 18 millimeter thick glue laminated board, a Siebdruckplatte called in German, with one rough 
depth and one smooth surface. Here's my reasoning. Board thickness is not much of a factor when it comes to final wall stability because the board must be stabilized and stiffed up by a back frame anyway. Board thickness is a factor though when it comes to providing flash for screws you will need later for mounting climbing holes on that thing. Keep in mind, the bigger your holes or rather the more your holes stand out from the board, the more leverage, the more flash you need. Good for me, I thought. I'll only mount small bed holes anyway, so with 18mm thickness I should be on the safe side. Why one smooth surface? On overhanging training boards you actually want to avoid the usual sanding of climbing walls to allow you digging much deeper into very small holes without rasping your finger and toe tips off, plus you can't exploit friction stepping anyway. The back side shouldn't be as smooth as the front though, this would reduce friction on the back frame, which is a bad thing regarding stiffness and stability. One standard sized 3 meter times 1.5 meter times 18 millimeter laminated board would cost around 300 euros by far the most expensive part of the project. I was fine with the width, but as you might have realized I needed more length according to my calculations to achieve a 45 degree overhang and a 30 centimeter kicker. However, that would bump up the price to 600 euros because they would have to cut a new board. In hindsight, what I should have done at this point is ask them whether they have a residual piece from another cut just to make the kicker. Good hardware stores save and sell usable residual pieces, a good tip to remember, but in that moment I didn't think about that. Instead, I recalculated everything assuming 280 cm board length and a 20 cm kicker, which would result in around 40 degrees of overhang, 5 degrees less steep than originally planned, but in the end I was willing to sacrifice 5 degrees of steepness to save 300 euros. Well, then the holes will have to be even smaller, I thought. I will get into the total cost of this project later. Side note, earlier I said a kicker adds extra steepness. What if I had no kicker and just let the edge of the uncut 3 meter board hit the floor? According to my calculations, this would result in only 38 degrees of overhang, so indeed a kicker adds steepness if total board length is constant. Keep that in mind. Now that I knew what materials I'd work with, I could proceed to the final step of planning, how will I mount this thing. So let's play with some numbers here. 3 times 1.5 meters means 4.5 square meters of glue laminated board and with 13 kilograms per square meter at 18 millimeter thickness, which is a number I got from the hardware store and confirmed later on the internet, this means around 60 kilograms of weight just the board. Add to that the framing, mounting system, hinges for the kicker, a bunch of screws and climbing holes. Let's round it up to 100 kilograms. Let's add to that a way too heavy climber doing a dyno to the top or so. Let's bump it up to 200 kilograms. That's assuming the ceiling carries everything and the floor carries nothing, which is not the case when the wall is set up, obviously. We live right under the roof of a big house and our ceiling features quite massive oak beams. I did a bit of calculating and research, which I'm sparing you now, trying to estimate the weight one of these beams can carry. Long story short, it is probably in the tons. Now of course I can impossibly estimate the weight one beam carries already, after all it's part of the roof construction. However, I'm pretty sure that an extra 200 kilograms are well inside the construction oversizing tolerance, especially when mounted over a length of 1.5 meters and close to a bearing. After all, you should also be able to mount a hanging chair carrying 150 kilograms or so without any problems. That's how heavy they can get by the way if two heavy climbers like myself throw their eternal flubberness in there. Uh, yeah, anyway, the point here is that you need to think about these things beforehand, specific to your situation or you might end up with a surprise. Climbing walls can get pretty heavy pretty fast, especially when big normal holes with the classic screwing system are used. Keep in mind, my example is only a small wall using only small wooden screw-ons. If in doubt, always talk to a professional constructional engineer. Side question, what had I done if those beams wouldn't exist? I must admit those beams were a major factor, major motivator for this project. Without them, I'd try a supporting structure coming from the floor with the vertical beams close to the wall and horizontal ones close to the ceiling so that as little room as possible is lost, that way kinda mimicking a roof beam situation but supported from the ground. Maybe I'll think about that in more detail when we move again. Spacing is figured out, we know what materials we need, we have a conception of the mounting, sounds like we're ready for execution. Time for part 2 of the video, let's start building. 
I went back to the hardware store and got the board, cut in such way that the kicker would be separate and the main wall would be split in half lengthwise. The splitting was necessary because of two reasons, firstly it would be physically impossible to move a 2.8 times 1.5 meter board through the quite tight staircase of our house, while moving a 2.8 times 0.75 meter board would be possible if we just opened the window to stick out the board a little bit to get around the corner. Again, something you better think about beforehand. Secondly, it would then be possible to transport the part with the good old caddy bro and save around 100 euros on delivery. One advice here, if you have to split, split parallel to the wall height longitudinally, in my case, if you can, dividing such a wall in height will cost you a lot of stability if the wall will be overhanging and you will need significantly stronger back framing as a result. Along with the board I got more stuff, spruce beams for the framing, some rods for the first climbing holes, some massive steel hooks and loops for mounting and a bunch of screws, a bunch of cordage and straps for a potential retraction mechanism. Time to mention the total cost of this project which checks in at around 400 euros. I feel that I worked quite cost efficient, probably there's little room on the cheaper side but there's obviously a lot of potential on the expensive side as always. The biggest threat being making a planning mistake and having to throw away or rebuy stuff. I made a couple of time lapses to give you an idea of the building process. First step was to get everything up in that room and laying down the boards side by side, front side up, so that I could proceed with stiffening them up by attaching the first piece of back frame. Always screw through the board first, then into the back frame pieces. This way you get the maximum stability and you will later on be able to see where you can't screw on holes anymore. For the back frame I mostly used spruce beams with a cross section of 5 times 3 cm, the 3 cm side going to the board for maximum stability. As you know I'm a big fan of wood, probably you could also use metal to get this job done and save a little space and weight. At two points it was necessary to use a beam of 5 times 5 cm cross section, namely at the top to get increased stability for the mounting construction and in the middle to sew the two halves together a bit more tightly. I wanted to put that wall up as soon as possible because that would make the further building process a lot easier. So I drove four steel hooks into that ceiling beam and four steel loops into the top beam of the frame and the board in line and leveled out with a bubble level. This was very necessary because the ceiling beam is not perfectly parallel to the floor. I balanced this out via varying thread turns on those ceiling hooks. Another thing to think about better sooner than later. I also want to mention the importance of pre-drilling everything when it comes to the back frame and mounting construction. It adds a lot of tedious work but it reduces the chance of splitting beams dramatically, especially if you're using something light like spruce. Now came a crucial step, hinging the wall onto the beam. This was a struggle, we needed 4 or 5 tries until we got it done, me lifting up and steering the wall, my girlfriend looking up and telling me where I should go to fiddle the loops on the hooks. At this point the wall was already over 60 kilos, so I had maybe 20 seconds until my shoulders and triceps ran out and I had to put the wall down again. In hindsight it would have been a lot easier and probably also a lot safer to get a third person on board, literally, and lift the wall with two people. But yeah, time was short and I wanted to make progress, after all you don't want to block the whole room forever with your DIY project, especially if you actually want to keep that girlfriend. Once the wall was standing, I completed the back frame and attached the kicker with four hinges to make it retractable and some blocks with rubber pads so that it's quite fixed in position on the floor when the wall is set up. Here a preliminary result. Alright, so the back construction is finished. We've got this beautiful star there and these two little blocks here and here to sew the two parts together, so to say. And as you can see, I mean, let's try it out. It already makes a pretty rigid impression, just with the mounting up there and by standing on the floor like this. From here I mounted three pieces of static cordage of which a single one could carry the wall to connect the middle back of the wall with beam number three in such way that the cords would be under tension when the wall is set up. This has two effects, firstly it makes the wall even more rigid and less prone to wiggle when more hefty moves are performed and secondly a significant portion of the total weight, I guess 20 to 30 kilos, is redirected towards beam number 3, taking stress off beam number 2 and the floor. The wall at this point is ready for setting and even for bouldering. However, leaving it like that would have transformed our small flat into a small climbing gym. I don't know how much entry I could charge for this, the little wall, decent hangboard, rings, pull up bar, hmm. 
now that I think about it. Anyway, I wanted to be able to retract the wall to the ceiling so that we would be able to use the room normally if it wasn't training time. I started the retraction mechanism by driving in four more steel loops, two left, two right of the wall to allow anchoring some strapping there. I also drove two hooks into the back framing so that cordage for lifting and lowering the wall would be able to run through. These should actually be loops too, but at this point I ran out of loops so I had to improvise a little bit. Now a very basic mechanism was created. By pulling on a rope you could lift and lower the wall slowly. Once at the ceiling it had to be held in place by one person while another person got the two fixing straps of beam number 3 and 4 in place. There's a handful of issues with this mechanism. You can't set up or retract the wall alone. When retracted the strapping is always under tension. Not a good thing for long term safety. This also leads to issue number 3. The wall hangs a bit down when retracted unparalleled to the ceiling which is not so pretty for the eye because even when static cordage is used it will always stretch a bit under stress but most importantly the lifting and lowering is quite unsafe if you'd lose hold of the rope when the wall is lifted it would just come down full force so to take off stress from all the safety strapping and rope once the wall is up and to attach it properly parallel to the ceiling I came up with the idea of using a support from ground I constructed a support out of the same 3 times 5 cm beams used for the back framing just for clinching the wall down at maximum height once Attracted. Then Mona actually had the perfect idea for lifting and lowering safety. Why not use a semi-automatic belaying device in that binder instead of just running the rope through? I can't believe actually I didn't come up with this myself. Now letting go of the lifting rope when the wall is lifted is not a big deal, a Grigory will take care of it. Not only makes this the setup process a lot safer, but it also allows the wall to be retracted alone, without the help of the second person. It is more tedious alone, but it is doable. Once retracted, we would now have four lines of safety keeping the wall up. First line of defense, so to say, is that support beam. It carries around 50% of the weight when the wall is up. Then the two diagonal straps, carrying maybe 10% of the weight, with the rest being carried by the mounting. And finally the rope for lowering and lifting, which is attached to the binder via clove hitch. Note that each one of these can easily hold the whole weight of the wall alone. And that's how we built that wall. It was quite a struggle, but I think it was worth it. The sessions on this thing are amazing, but I think that has rather something to do with the holes that are actually on this wall, which is something that I've talked about a lot in previous episodes. Anyway, as the usual deal, you know, please drop a like if you got something from the video and don't forget to share, to share your personal experience. You know, when it comes to building DIY climbing walls, if you have something to share, help a fellow builder out there out somewhere. And with that, I would say thank you so much for watching. I'll see you soon. Stay, cr stay, stay strong. Keep crushing. That's how the proper order is. And I'll see you soon in the next one. Bye.